Hi, my name is Joshua Damas. I'm the director of Quebecit, and you are listening to ContraZoom. This is ContraZoom, where we go back and forth about film. I'm your host, Dakota Arsenault, and today's episode is presented by Aesthetic Magazine. Back on episode 125, I reviewed films that I'd watched during Cinefest Sudbury. It was my first time getting to attend the festival and did so digitally. I saw seven films and overall was very pleased with the curation and content, making me want to attend the fest in person one day. On that episode, Stephanie and I talked about Quebecsit, a Canadian satire about Quebec deciding to leave the rest of Canada and the mold of England trying to leave the European Union and the comedy that arises from such a scenario. On this episode, we have the director and writer of the film come on to discuss the creative process behind the movie and have a fun political conversation. I hope you enjoy the show. The third Quebec sovereignty referendum has yielded a narrow win for the separatists. Well, Quebec's not going to tear our country apart over a vague question and a 50 plus one vote. Bonjour, hi. This stops here. Yeah. But I. Well, that's the guillotine. Well, they're here. Pas de pièces anciennes québécoises. Ah, que t'as gagné. Pas de passage. The Canadian military isn't equipped to fight against itself. I am now joined by Joshua Demers, the director, writer, and producer of the new Canadian satire, Quebexit, that shows an alternate future where Quebec has a third and successful referendum to leave Canada and form their own country, while showing the difficulties such a thing would lead to. Joshua, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, you know, my birthday's coming up, so I'm kind of having all of those existential crises that tend to follow one's birthday, but besides that, I'm great. Well, happy early birthday. Thank you very much. We actually have a bit of a connection. Last year, I interviewed Martha Kehoe and Joan Tassoni, directors of Gordon Lightfoot, If You Could Read My Mind, a film that you worked on as a production manager. Yeah, small world. Yeah. Now, how, how did the interview go? They're, they're wonderful people. Oh, so fantastic. They just had so much <laughs> insightful knowledge to share. And it's interesting. I, I think they were in the same room together on a speakerphone. So listening to them sort of finishing each other's sentences was, was really interesting. Yeah, no, it was kind of the experience of making it as well. They're super knowledgeable, super talented, super experienced. And just, uh, you know, as someone who knew of Gordon Lightfoot, you know, probably a little bit more so than most people my age and my generation, um, realizing that there was so much more to learn was just kind of fascinating. And also, like, you know, you, you end up breaking out the guitar and singing loudly. Because, <laughs> no, it's just like, you know, the, the songs are like uh, very... And they're not simple songs, but they're mm-hmm. just, if you're a guitar player, man, it's a good time. Yeah, yeah. It was a fantastic film, one that I really enjoyed. Every time I see, every time I see it, I just remember, you, you see the making of it. Rather, so it's taken me a while to actually just see it as a film, but yeah, it is wonderful. Your film had its world premiere at Cinefest Sudbury, a festival that uh, this podcast covered along with your movie. But due to COVID, the festival mostly went digital. As a first-time feature film director, were you disappointed you weren't able to share the film in person with other film lovers? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it sucks. There's no, there's no way around it. Because then everyone asks you, how, how did it go? And you're like, well, I think. You know, you just, I assume 10 million people streamed it. Like, yeah, I don't know what else to say. So you kind of, that's the joke. But yeah, no, it's just like you, it's all about expectation. And I think, you know, as a filmmaker, you kind of, you do have this expectation of a moment like, the closure moment of the film is you show it to an audience and you have other, and you can kind of in real time feel what people are saying. The cast and crew are there and you just kind of like, you're kind of tuned in and to, you know, the creative waves. And that's like the ending point. And I think with COVID it's really difficult because you don't really get closure on the film. You don't really have that moment of like, it's done. It's just kind of like, so it just kind of feels like a blip. Um, you know, I think Sudbury did a remarkable job under the circumstances. I, it's, I think this is, there's a lot of things about the COVID experience that will stay. I think film festivals are now going to be always a hybrid, partially online, because I just think you can reach more people that way. 
but they and they will always be kind of like a more in person kind of exclusive gala component. But yeah, no, they it, it is always going to be a little disappointing that you don't get that, you know, either those cheers or those booze, you know, or those that, that one person asking you a question like when you get into a fight in a Q and A. Those are the fun times. Mm-hmm. Did you have something planned and then you had to cancel it, or, or what was the deal with the the, the presentation? Well, we were rushing to finish. And um, I think the mistake that was, I think the, the mistake I think I've learned from is you never submit a work in progress to any festival. They say you can, but you never do it. It's just a bad call. Because unless you are a big studio film and they see stars in it and they see like, oh, of course, their work in progress is have like a temp sound mix and a temp color correct, even though they say they don't. Like, I, I just think people are used to seeing something polished. And so we were kind of, we were submitting some work in progresses and we weren't really getting kind of much traction. And then, the, you know, when we finished the film and it's polished, you know, we, we get into Sudbury and we get into a, another festival, which we'll talk about later. And, um, we, like I said, it was just kind of rushing to finish because, you know, we had a certain deadline. Um, so I think I answered your question. Yeah. Maybe that was like a Mike Pence answer and I kind of just dodged around a bit. <laughs> it's all good. Such a, a large part of this film is, is language and how important it is for the characters and their identity. You have a, a French military officer telling one of his men to not include the hello and bonjour hello. You have Me Too, one of the Micmac women chastising Susan for not... Oh, uh, she's, uh, I didn't want to stress this, and I, I wanted to do it in the comment, but I didn't want to also be that guy. And this, this could be my fault, mm-hmm. but uh, Mitos and her sister are Cree. Ah, my apologies. And they're on... There's, they're, no, 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 it's totally... It's, and they're on Micmac territory, and or unceded land, and we, the, you know, the reason is we wanted to ensure that there was complexity in each storyline. We wanted, we didn't want people to assume that these, everything was kind of like this one block. Mm-hmm. Like we wanted to show, like, you know, within the Quebecois storyline, you had like a Federalist, who was kind of more bilingual, you had kind of like a pure line Quebecois, you had kind of a new sovereigntist who was, you know, uh, you could, was not, for lack of a better word, not white, because Quebec is sometimes Within the, within the sovereignty movement, they kind of had those tensions. Like the, you have the kind of like the new younger sovereigntists who are very diverse, and you kind of have the older sovereigntists who who do predominantly tend to be white. So you know we were trying to show all of that. So it was important, you know, when we were all working together to craft the indigenous storyline, we wanted to just to make sure that it was it was showing that you know just to reflect that there's because there's so many nations and communities. There's over six hundred First Nations, there's different Inuit communities and and BT. So. Anyway, but at the same time, as a first time viewer, maybe not pick, like we put clues in there, but you know, if you didn't pick it up on it, it's like then that's my fault. I mean, I thought I made it clear, but um, at the same time, we were, as I think you noted in your review, there's like a lot. And that, that we can also have a conversation whether the, the a lot was a good I call or a bad call. I think it was obviously a good call because for me, that was the fun of the film was just like this spiral of complexity, for lack of a better word. But anyway, so that was, but I just, I do feel like I just wanted to stress that because I wanted to respect like that's what we tried to do and also be there speaking Cree and I didn't want to misrepresent. No, I know. I'm glad you corrected me. This was something that when I was, I was taking my notes and prepping for this that I wasn't totally sure because I, I actually looked up, I was like, I, I thought at one point they said that they were speaking Cree and then I was looking up a, a map of the Quebec, New Brunswick area and not realize and seeing that it was Micmac territory. And so I was a little confused. So thank you for correcting me. And I'm, and I'm glad that you did. Yeah, so like I said, it's a, anytime you do a movie about Canada, it's a, a learning experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I guess sort of like the, the sort of the basis of the question is like, you have all these different people and then you also have an English language soldier who's complaining that he can't understand everyone and just wants everyone to speak English. What does language reveal in the characters you wrote and why does it define them so much? How many languages do you speak? Is there sort of curiosity? I speak one when I was, when I was young, I did speak some French. Uh, my family is from New Brunswick, so I do have that sort of, uh, non-Quebecois French, uh, in my background, but I unfortunately lost it as I got older. So I'm kind of similar in a way because my dad, like his, my dad's Frank's phone. Mm-hmm. Um, he's kind of, he still speaks French, but he's a bit, it's a bit similar to when he does speak it. And I've kind of noticed that he, it takes him a while to get comfortable. Um, so I kind of, was kind of hit or miss learning it growing up and it was only in my 20s that I kind of really had this sense of something was taken from me even though that's kind of like a juvenile way to express it and you know I really put my efforts into learning French and reconnecting with my Quebecois roots 
uh, as much as I can. You know, we have members of our family who's, who are Francophones. And I think in the process of learning French, which is really distilled to me, is language is a completely different way of being, seeing, existing, thinking, laughing. It's, uh, it's, an, it's who you are. And all you have to do is try to exist in a second language for a period of time. And you'll start noticing a couple things. You'll start noticing how you feel. You'll get frustrated. You'll feel stupid, for lack of a better word, because you are basically, you know, you're a child in the language. You're still, le- you're, that's the level that you speak it. You'll, you'll find yourself hard to express things. And then you, as soon as you, but once the, the important thing about that experience is that's how everyone else feels when they're speaking a second language. And Graham Fraser, who's the official languages commissioner as of Canada for a period of time, mentioned that, you know, every country kind of has like, I'm paraphrasing here, like this fundamental issue, like this kind of thing that has defined the country in a way. And in the beginning, like for America, it was race. For, you know, the UK, it was class. For Canada, it's language. So it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you live with someone who speaks differently than you? Because what ends up, without one of them having to compromise. And that often happens in Canada with the uh, Francophones and Anglophones. Is like, you know, the average Francophone probably speaks better English than the Anglophone speaks French. This is based on statistics, based on, and I think it's fairly safe with anecdotal evidence. Oh, yeah. I go to Montreal and they all speak English. Yeah. So you're putting a burden on the Francophones because they have to speak your language. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that just fundamentally changes everything. And people just want to exist as themselves in the way they think and have who they are. And language is a key part of that. Yeah. So I think that, you know, if you're trying to talk about Canada, and like, they, like so that's just kind of like the Anglophone French one. We, we also have to at least be aware of like the other hundreds of languages in the indigenous communities and their languages that have been attacked. So it's like all of, it's just people, you know, this whole, the, the whole kind of thing is like people want to exist as themselves in all of their complexity without kind of having to be kind of bullied by other people but it's like how do you make you know 37 million people move in the same direction mm-hmm. without you know coming to issues of assimilation so like those are kind of like the the tensions i think that exist in you know the, the territory that is internationally recognized as canada so the film was you know, like I don't even say it's like an attempt to explore that because the film is, you can't make the film that important. Like I think I obviously think the film is very important. It means something very special to me. It means something very. I hope it means something very much to our collaborators and the actors, the other writers, and you know, I, I, I that's your hope. But it, the our country doesn't belong to us. It belongs to everyone, kind of like not to be cheesy. So, you know, the, the film can only really just be made by the people who made it and speak for them in them that moment of time and be a conversation starter mm-hmm. in a way that I don't really think we do too much in Canada. I think we kind of just make stories for very specific kind of groups, like communities, like we'll, as opposed to trying to tell something that kind of speaks cross-culturally. Um, but that's kind of something that is one of, one of my personal obsessions. But. Well, I think that's a really good segue because it's something, you know, a great long running joke in the film is you have, uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada fighting over borders and who owns what land. Well, the indigenous characters specifically in the film and frankly, indigenous people all across the country have to laugh at the absurdity of the situation in general, since they've had the exact same thing happening to them for eons. Was it your plan from the start to sort of examine this story from this third and unfortunately often forgotten side of Canada's history? I think, I think, like I said, I, and I want to, I think one of the things that making the film is really kind of stressed to me is, like just to make sure, sure I do not overstep. Like I can only speak for myself and I can only speak kind of with that limited authority of that. Um, and then to, to make this film, we really had to kind of like kind of bring a, a, big, a big group of people together who kind of brought their own stories. So like what, like the whole film is about sovereignty. So every character had to have creative sovereignty and like with, with the other, other writers, you know, they had to have sovereignty over, certain things in a certain storyline as well. Otherwise the film just wouldn't work. So I think how it started was it was just me, you know, like when it was just like the idea stage, it was just like my 
like I said, you know, film people try to work out their, it's like therapy. They're trying to work out their, their issues. I was, you know, as a son of a Francophone, son of an Anglophone, born in Quebec to a, probably born in Alberta to a military family. You, you know, this is, I could identify as Canadian as a child. Like that was like the simplest way to just say who I was. And then you, so Quebec sovereignty kind of becomes this other force that attacks that. So being the kind of anxious person I am, when I'm worried about something, I just become obsessed with it and I start studying it. So then you start trying to study Quebec sovereignty. And then, you know, first you just start with the dates and the, you know, what happened and the arguments. And then you're like, you start argue meeting, you start meeting sovereignty and start arguing. And then you start learning the language and you start arguing with them in the language. And then you start realizing they have a point. And it's not that, I think that, you know, at the time that I was wrong, but you start realizing because you, you start seeing them as people with agency and identity and you start caring about them. And you're like, well, I want you to be happy. For you to be happy, I have to lose something that makes me happy. And then you realize I can't tell this story by myself because I don't, I, you know, I can't speak to the Quebec angle. And then at the same time, you know, if you do any bit of studying in like 95, the, you know, the James Bay Cree held their own referendum with Matthew Kuhncombe organized it. Um, and they like over 90% said they wanted to stick in, stay in Canada. And Jack Parizzo was very much like Nabra, like you guys, you can't do that. You can't, you can't hold a referendum and separate. We can. And then they, you know, then they, they started having to trying to make these arguments. Like you guys can't make an argument because we're a provincial government and provincial as a provincial government, we're a state that can do that. And you guys, so that you get into this weird kind of circular argument about sovereignty. And so like, it, it's obviously clear, like you can't tell the story without talking, like without having an indigenous component, like without, and then you start wondering, well, how do I do that? And I think I was, I was very lucky because there's a, to have some key people come into the project and kind of just really gear it towards avoiding some major missteps, you know, avoiding kind of, you know, you know, settler filmmakers trying to tell indigenous stories, which we weren't, wasn't the goal at all. We we're trying to tell this ensemble. And then, you know, luckily there was a, there's a great um, person at Telephone who's the indigenous liaison, Adam Garner Jones. And he kind of was, you know, had conversation, we had conversations and then you kind of realize, ah, like I really need collaborators, like people with control, creative control of the project in creative control over this part of the story because I can't tell it. Like, I, I can't. Like, it's, it's not my right. I don't know enough. I haven't lived it. I don't I don't speak the language. I don't think in the language. And so, as, you know, through serendipity, we we had, we had known of Gail. She's a very talented actress and filmmaker and, and creator. And so, you know, she kind of joined the project. And she had worked with Zav before on a, on a, one of her shorts. So, like, she kind of joined the project and, you know, it was just basically like she created the character of Mito, like out of, you know, from what we, from the ideas of what that storyline could be, she kind of created the character of Mito and that completely changed what that storyline was. And then it just became this wonderful thing where, because Zav and Gail were both actors in this, the project, like the cast became through the, and because they were writers, the cast became super important and we had more cast members and crew members. So you had every cast member is like the conversation you had with them is like, this is your character. This is where what they kind of represent. You have creative sovereignty over them. So it's going to get to a point where you tell me what they do. I'm not going to tell you what they do. You do. And then so they, then you start seeing kind of for lack of like this beautiful, beautiful chaos in the sense of creatively fulfilling, painful as a country. But then you just start, you start seeing all of these interactions. You start seeing, um, you know, the, the two scenes I think that kind of really stick out for me, like like from Mitos, where like Gail just kind of came up with, like the one at the end where she kind of, this, the kind of like the final conversation she has with the two soldiers, uh, the conversation in the car at the, you know, the night shooter, that was kind of just, that came through rehearsal. She, you know, one of the characters said, I would love if we could stand with you. And she was like, fuck off. And I'm like, well, that's the scene. That's, that's, that's the scene. Why don't we just make that the scene? And then that was the scene. So it's just like it became this beautiful kind of like process of that. And it's from, you know, the characters who are in it more often in terms of screen time to like even characters who don't have a lot of screen time, but, but it became really important for them to be fleshed out. And it's like, this is where like, I think with your note, it didn't, sorry, it I didn't bother me because, well, it did. Well, I mean, because you're a film person and you, you make something and you, I haven't had the time to like, like break up with it and like to go off into the mountains and come back like you know 30 you know 
five months later and be like, oh, I'm fine. Like, then you can read a review of it and you're like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, that's whatever. But like, you know, I was still kind of in the kind of the fresh wounds of having it, you know, delivering it. Um, but, you know, it, it's a fair point because then you're like, you know, there's a lot of things with secondary characters. And, you know, maybe if they were like more sharpened and more focused, it would feel less drawn out, which is fair. I mean, my, and I'm not even going to retort that, but for me, it was just like, it became important in all these minor characters because every time you have a collectivity, like every time you have this collective identity, it starts atrophying, it starts breaking apart. People become more individualistic. Like that happens in every bloody thing. Like you want to talk about, you look at Canada, it's like on, the, on all the different political factions, you start realizing as soon as like a collective identity starts weakening, then you, you start have like, you know, different provinces, different groups, different, you know, ethnic, like there's different people of different backgrounds, different languages, all chatting about, you know, I want this. No, I want this. No, that doesn't work. My grievance, your grievance. So it became important that the secondary characters did that. So that's where you had, like, Angus, the uh, the private, who kind of was, like, the, the person who represents, in a way, on, he was the Ontario guy. You start having kind of saying who's the Albertan, kind of, like, making these, you know, quips about, you know, well, fuck off, guys. Like, you know, let the Eastern Baptist bastards burn in the dark. You start having kind of, you know, this French guy who's stuck. But then you start, you're able to kind of explore like the diversity of like French identity, like the Francophony worldwide and how like, you know, Quebecois still has like this struggle to assert itself because France just looks down upon it. And then you start having, you know, then you have like Sauvé who, that the Francophone who is kind of closer to being a Francophone outside of Quebec, not being seen as Quebecois to the point of they're not even going to speak French to her. Because you're not only you're not you're not one of us, so why would we speak French to you? French is something for us, even though your French is perfect. So, you're so that was the attempt. And I know this is, seems like just like whoa, there's too much there, but I'm like that's the country, man. Like any time you start looking at it seriously with any depth, like that's the country. And you're trying to and you're hopefully trying to do it in a way with characters that people kind of are fleshed out, and they're not just you know. It's not like abstract Breck stuff where you're like, oh, this person represents that. What this person represents that. You're just trying to have like characters that can kind of speak to a collective experience. But that was kind of the, I even that was kind of the uh, the intent, and I at least the goal. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from. Um, this movie is filled with tons of little nuggets of Canadian political jokes, including stuff like the Meech Lake Accord and the FLQ. How much brushing up on your Canadian history did you have to do before working on the script? I don't know if we really had to do much because, I mean, we've been kind of living it for a while. I mean, Zav and I, who, um, who, who plays Lieutenant Hassan as one of the writers, we lived together. We were like roommates in Toronto. Like, you know, you know how in Toronto you have like five roommates when you're an indie artist? Yes. <laughs> he was one of them. And uh, he was from Quebec. He learned English in his 20s. Um, and we were just sitting around and I was, you know, in this process of like trying to better my French and one of the ways you better your French is anytime you know someone's a Francophone you just try to make your relationship go into French which for them is very frustrating and weird because they're like why are we speaking a language that like why don't we just speak English so anyway in the process of that he just kind of made a comment like oh I hope Quebec will be its one co- own country one day and I just was like what <laughs> and then we just it was like three four years of like this was like in 26 17 or something like it was like years of drinks and us arguing and we'd like i'd always bring it up he got annoyed at me how many times i brought it up we're just like every time we were out for drinks it came to back to this and i was like we'd have arguments and he'd just go back and he's like i don't care about your practical reasons emotionally we're just different he's like it's not i don't feel canadian i feel quebecois i'm like but you know and then i'll try to bring up you know stuff about you know how the meets lake Court all fell apart and yada 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 and all this stuff so it's just like you real, and then you started realizing like you're not going to convince the person and then you're like well that's what the, you know that's part of the movie and that's how it i think that's how it all everything came into it so i don't think there was really too much brushing up it was more like we were living it i see i, I see. would like be uh, he would he, i'd give him books to read he'd give me books to read he'd make me watch a documentary on Pierre follow though i'd like <laughs> respond back to him like we just like it just became this like debate and then that's what you know that was that component of the film was was that and then the beautiful thing is at the end of it we're both kind of like a little, we still believe what we believe, but we're both kind of like really soft. We're like just worn down by it. And he's kind of like, ah, I guess, you know, I'm kind of sovereign. But it's, 
not a big deal. And I'm kind of like, oh, I guess I am kind of like, I do like the idea of a United Canada, but I'm just worn down. Like it does, I don't feel when someone says, you know, I want Quebec to be its own country. I'm kind of like, oh, okay, cool. That makes sense. Like, I mean, I understand where you're coming from and, you know, I want you to be happy. Maybe, you know, maybe we can be friends. I don't know. I feel that's probably more of a, a common sentiment held amongst a lot of people. <laughs> yes. We have to learn to, we have to live with these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do have an interesting question. The, the film takes place on the border between Quebec and New Brunswick. Was there a thematic or stylistic choice for making it on the eastern border instead of between Quebec and Ontario on the western side of the province? <laughs> do you want the do you want like a me to like the film fancy answer? Or do you just want like the the real reason? Hey, no, whatever, whatever answer you have, if, if you think this is a, a joke question that doesn't deserve to be answered, I understand that too. No, it, 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 it deserves to be answered in its fullest, but I think this is kind of like one of the beautiful things about, you know, film scholarship and filmmaking. And it's like you both, they're like a very symbiotic thing and you need both. So the kind of the joy of it though is, you know, film makers sometimes are not as film literate as they should be. And film scholars sometimes think that there's meaning in everything. And it's this beautiful kind of moment of, you know, we, we knew very much we would not have a lot of money to make this. We got $125,000 from telephone. Um, that was it. We went a little bit over that, but we not, but we had to, but we had to fund ourselves, but, um, you don't have a lot of money. So if you did the Ontario border, you know, you're, where would it be? It's like, you're like four or what? Like one of the, the comedy of the film was like, okay, we don't have a lot of money. How do we make this work? And also what's funny. And you're like, what's funny is people who, are at the least important checkpoint ever. And they're to them, it's the most important checkpoint. So you're like, that's something that fits their budget dreams. And also creatively, that's interesting. Uh, originally it was supposed to be the, it was supposed to be the Labrador Quebec border. Interesting. And then, and then Zab was kind of like, he, was, he kept on coming back to this. He's like, there's no connecting thread. He's like, there's, there's something and this oftentimes happens when you write scripts, you're like, there's, you'll hit a point and you kind of like just the film kind of seems like it's going off the rails. Like you don't have that through line. And he's like, you need something to just keep it, you know, keep it, keep it a bit grounded. And we had talked about this pipeline and we're like, okay, well, why? he's like, you know, make it about the pipeline. So it's like, okay, this pipeline has to keep on coming back. And then you're like, well, they're not really going to build many pipelines through the Newfoundland Labrador, putting me through the Labrador Quebec border. They're only building them kind of that way. So it's like, well then, can't be Ontario. It has to be New Brunswick. Like, like it has to be like the it has to be in the middle of like the two major highways in New Brunswick. It has to be really in the middle of nowhere. And that's kind of how we narrowed it down. I know, but which seems like you know it's it's so it's more of a practical thing that we had to find creative solutions for. No, it, I I think it makes sense as a viewer because you think about if it's if the precipice of the film is this pipeline that needs to be built, you would assume that everything west of Quebec is on the same side of things. And then Quebec is sort of the sticking point if it needs to get to the rest of the country. So in that sense, it makes sense to me. And then you're also thinking about if it's on the Ontario side, what are you in Ottawa literally? And so this sort of middle of nowhere aspect, I think does lend some credence more to the comedy. And then just lastly, as uh, someone, as I said, my family's from New Brunswick. I super appreciated all the jokes of deep in fucking New Brunswick. I was, wor- I was worried. Like, I, I think like, I there's there's something about like you want to have fun, but you also like the, the only like I said the film kind of works when you try to make sure every person and has their complexity. So I was getting I was I was worried that we were pushing the New Brunswick joke too far, and then our production manager's from New Brunswick, and she's like, "No, double down." I'm like, okay. So we did. I think it's sort of the, the thing that like New Brunswick is pretty much not represented in Canadian arts as much as, you know, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, places like that. Newfoundland, huge in the Canadian arts scene. I think it just is a funny little joke about New Brunswick as a whole. Yeah, it's one of those things that I'm I'm sure it, it kind of needs its moment. There's a bunch of clubs. There's a bunch of complexity there. Like, I mean, Newfoundland, uh, New Brunswick politics is fascinating just because it's the only bilingual province. And seeing how they handle French and seeing how they're still having bloody debates about French when they have a third of the province is, you know, Francophone. You're like, well, this is kind of emblematic of the country. If you guys can't figure it out, how is, how are the, how are the rest of us going to figure it out? Mm-hmm. 
I think watching sort of the absolute gong show that has been Brexit these last few years, it's obvious how easy it would be to mine for comedy considering the the sheer number of small things that the people, people living over there didn't even consider when they voted to leave the European Union. Was that where a lot of the ideas for the story came from? Because I see a lot of uh, not quite one-to-one connections, but similar ideas of, oh, they didn't think about that. How can we mine this for comedy? I think, like I said, it came from probably more historical. I mean, there's a great book um, that uh, Chantal Hebert and Jean Lepage did, I think Lepage, pardon me, uh, about, um, it's called The Morning After, or the, the Matin Suivant. Uh, oh, my French, I messed up. The Matin Suivant, excuse me. Um, about just, she, and they interviewed all the major players in 95, and, they, and the question was, what would have happened if it went the other way? Like, what, were, what plans did you have in place? Like, would, would Crip Chang recognize the results? Um, how fast would Perizo try to move? Were like, what did Bouchard and Mary Dumont want? Like, and it just is a fascinating portrait because Bouchard couldn't get Perizo on the phone. Like, Perizo stopped taking his phone calls, <laughs> and Bouchard was supposed to be like the chief negotiator because Bouchard was very popular. Perizo was a bit kind of a not the most charismatic man. He was more of a very kind of like cerebral in his head type dude. Um. And Perizzo kind of was using Bouchard to kind of make, because, at, you know, at the beginning, they were pulling in for, at 40%. So they were far off from winning. So bringing Bouchard on into the campaign and uniting the sovereignist front was, like, huge for them almost winning. But as soon as it seemed like they were going to win, he stopped talking to Bouchard. And Bouchard was like, and Dumont were like, we would have slammed the brakes on anything Perizzo tried to do. Because Perizzo was basically like, we'll do a year of negotiation. And then we're going to do a unilateral declaration of independence. Like if we do not negotiate separation, I, I'm going to push this thing, this thing off a cliff. So just even that, like, holy crap, that's a like Game of Thrones type level drama in Canada that we don't talk about. That's fascinating. That, and then you look at Brexit, which is like you get a free kind of pay-per-view version of that on a, on a grander, on a, on a huge scale with Scotland, Catalonia, like you, with all these independence movements, you kind of, they're similar but different and you can kind of mine them for, for um, for inspiration, so of course, like Brexit, it influences things you do, especially with like the northern. You know, I've having had some lovely conversations with people in Belfast about this. So you know, the northern Ireland, yeah, northern Ireland border and the Ireland border. It's just like every time you're trying to like draw lines in the sand and define people's identity, when you have groups of people who just fundamentally don't agree on things, it's like that becomes your inspiration. And in Canada, we just don't talk about this enough, and I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I think there's, I thought, and so I, I was, I guess a part of me was hoping the film would change that. And I guess we'll see. But um, yeah, we don't like to talk about this type of stuff for some reason. I was just going to say, I, I can't remember where I heard it, but I heard it somewhat recently, this idea of most of the important conversations we need to have as a society usually stems from, from art in the first place because it's always something simmering behind the scenes and then it takes uh you know a movie a a book or or something like that where it really sort of drives the conversation to the forefront so in that case that's exactly what you were doing oh hopefully well like i said it's like the the beautiful like the experience of making it was realizing how little i could speak to my own country because it doesn't like i said it doesn't belong to me and me trying to propose like and I think it, it even happened with like the first draft of the script, which was much kind of a little bit more kumbaya. And then Zav was kind of, and Gail were very smart in saying that's really uncool. Like, and which, which is, you know, so the ending kind of be something that I'm particularly proud of because it does feel at least that people kind of maintain their complexity and people maintain their, who they are and people maintain their disagreement. And that's, I think, vital. Um, and I think, uh, like I said, it's up to people to decide where to go from here. Mm-hmm. It's, and what, what, how they view their, how they view their country. Is it a vehicle for quality of life? Is it, you know, uh, I find a lot of times when people talk, like when Anglophones talk about Canada, like they're pitching a version of Canada that I don't recognize anymore. Like, cause it's like, well, it's like you, you, you're not speaking of a version that Francophones can speak to, and you're not speaking a version, you're not, pitching a version of a country that has actually dealt with its past in any meaningful way. So it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you go on? Yeah. So like I said, it's like, you realize you, you're humbled by how little you can actually offer on it beyond just like, wow, like we, 
we got to make space for other voices and see what happens and try to see if we can create avenue like and try to you know take uh take that seriously mm-hmm. no absolutely I guess, you know, starting to wrap things up a little bit here, you make up one half of Coconut Effect Productions, which is the team behind Quebexit. What is uh, your company's mission? How does it reflect both productions you have already made and for future ones? Well, it's a, Coconut Effect is a combo between uh, Shannon Fuster and myself. Shannon's a producer and a writer, and she's created her own wonderful uh, digital series that we're, you know, we're, it's in the, we're in the process of making, but, you know, we're, we're also kind of seeing where it goes called Lady Ada Secret Society. And it kind of speaks to things that she's passionate about, which is, um, you know, girls in STEM being rebellious and cool and gross and funny. And you kind of look at that and you're like, then you look at Crystal Clear and you look at the Bexit and you're like, well, what, you know, what's the connection? And then you, I think one of the things that film companies do that I really detest is they try to brand themselves as something. For us, we're like, we're people who like making things. And we make things we want to make. And we often in Canada have to make them with less resources than we want to make, which is a very Canadian thing. So Coconut Effect, which if you're a Monty Python fan, I hope you can appreciate. Of course. Uh, is kind of like you're, that's what, that's what making movies in Canada is like. That's what making content in Canada is like. And then I, strangely enough, when you look at stuff, I, I do think that you see kind of some similar threads. Like there's an irreverence. There's a, uh, a, there's, you know, there, there, there's always a sense of humor, but there's always a willingness to kind of go where the drama needs to go. Cause you know, I think you, it's hard to separate the drama and the comedy from life. I think they're just too interconnected. After screening Quebec at, uh, Cinefest Sudbury, what does, uh, the future hold for the film? Well, like I said, we have another festival coming up and we have a couple other ones we're waiting for. So we're kind of still doing the festival, uh, dipping the water, uh, dipping our toes in the water. Um, we've been in, there's been some distributor interest, which, which we're just sorting out. But obviously the, the the goal of any Canadian film is you just need to find a place where people can go to watch it. Mm-hmm. And because Canadian films tend to have a long, tend to have a long, long tail. There's like, there's so many films that like from way, like one of my favorite Canadian films is uh, one called The Bay of Love and Sorrows, which is from like 2002, which for some reason I just, I'm like, always baffled that this people don't talk about this because it's one of the few it takes place in New Brunswick. So as a New Brunswick key, you should totally check it out someday. Um, but it like, deals with class. It's just, it's, it's very interesting and powerful. And, um, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, people that will discover, mm-hmm. like you'd like, there's so many Canadian films that you discover, like, that, you know, you, we don't have, we're not the same model as the States where you just pump something out, try to get like Oscar nominations and then you have like a year or two of notice and then it goes on to Netflix and people may watch it one day. Like I think we're, we're much more of a model. We're, we're creating things that last. Mm-hmm. And you're hoping that kind of very much like a Supreme Court justice dissent that's kind of dug up years later. You're, you know, you're, you're trying to get it to the front of as many eyeballs as possible. I mean, I think the next festival will be important because we can show our French language version and it'll be available to people in Quebec. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. I know the French language interviews have been interesting so far. Awesome. Yeah, so that's it. And then, like I said, make sure it goes on a place. So we have plans and ideas, but that's uh, that's the plan. I think that's how the sausage is made, so to speak. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today, Joshua, and all the best with the film. Thanks so much, my friend. And uh, like I said, it was a pleasure, and thanks for reaching out. Of course. You don't think it would make the rest of Canada more, more likely to fall prey to Look, if the only identity Canada has is holding on to Quebec. Bonjour, je m'appelle Joshua Demers et vous êtes en train d'écouter Contre Zoom. Once again, thank you to Joshua for coming on and discussing his film. Make sure you stay tuned for when and where you can watch this movie. I'll do my best to continue to update listeners on social media about any release information. Speaking of which, make sure you follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at ContraZoomPod. I want to thank Eric and Kevin Smale for the theme music and Stephanie Pryor for the logo design. Thank you to Aesthetic Magazine for presenting the show. Please visit ContraZoomPod.com for all your CZP needs and bookmark it as I'll be adding lots of cool content to it over time. 
Please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts and send a screenshot to contrazoompod at gmail.com and I'll add you to a list to mail you some free swag when they are available. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.